The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone, on that positive note, welcome to the STOA. Uh, I'm Peter Limberg, the steward of the STOA. And the STOA is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. And today is the last session of Networked Tribalism. Uh, John Robb was the sense maker in residence here at the STOA for the month of August, uh, which is coming uh, to an end today. Uh, and for those of you who do not know John Robb, I imagine most people here do. He's a military analyst, author, and entrepreneur, and he, he does something on Patreon called the Global Gorillas Report. Um, and that video was embedded in one of his um, recent documents for August. So today is blue skies. We're going to have some blue sky thinking about what's next uh, in terms of network tribalism, how today's going to work, as John's going to share his thoughts. Uh, you know, I might warm up with some questions. And if you have any questions, if you have questions right now, just start throwing them in uh, the chat. Uh, the, the first 60 minutes uh, will be recorded, then we'll stop. If you have to go, you have to go. Then we'll have a, a kind of a more intimate sense making session for the remaining 30 minutes. So that being said, I will allow John to unmute himself and take him in. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Thanks, Peter. And thanks everyone for showing up. Uh, wow, it's been a heck of a month. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do is maybe, you know, review where we're at right now, and then uh, let's talk about potential solutions. Um, the solution set is pretty hard, uh, but um, it's going to take some bold thinking in order to get us out of this predicament. Uh, I wrote a report a couple years ago called The Online War, and it was about, you know, how online warfare works uh, as opposed to traditional forms of warfare. Um, Boyd, uh, John Boyd, probably America's greatest strategist, once said that, you know, war is a contest between minds. Typically, that means, you know, between opposing generals or opposing leadership uh, cadres, um, running nation states or running organizations. Uh, the difference is today, in the online world, uh, in online warfare, uh, it's a war of every mind against every mind. Everyone's a participant. And this goes back to uh, Marshall McLuhan in the 60s said uh, that uh, World War III is a guerrilla information war where everyone is a participant. There's no dividing line between civilians and the military. Um, and that's certainly true today. We're all participants in this conflict. And uh, what is it over? And it's pretty clear to me, at least what I did in this report and what I've been writing about since, is that this is a war over control of societal decision-making processes. Uh, without all of the uh, tr traditional abstractions that are usually involved in, in that conflict where we'd have you know, nation states and militaries and agencies doing war for us you know, at, a, at a distance, we're now actively engaged in this. And to a smaller extent, this has occurred um, in pre previous civil disturbances and, and different, you know, cultural overhauls. Um, but uh, this is a ongoing process for control of the whole thing. Because this is a, because due to the way that technology has been developed, the technology makes it possible to change everything all at once, particularly through AI censorship and molding and modification of how we converse, how we interact, uh, how we form organizations, how those organizations act, uh, how the money flows, what are the uh, you know different outcomes. This is all the a, a war for control of that. 
and whoever wins gets to set the terms for not only uh, immediate gains or losses, but potentially for you know decades, centuries beyond this. Um, all right, so where are we at right now? Well, uh, the, the online war is intensifying. And in online warfare, in this kind of conflict, uh, the physical battles that we see are uh, punctuation marks in an ongoing online uh, uh, conflict. Uh, it's not the primary, it's not the center of gravity for the conflict. Uh, it's meant to drive online opinion one way or another or, or sentiment or reduce the cohesion of the, of the uh, opposing uh, force. Uh, we've seen an intensification this month and you know, starting with the Kenosha and the you know, Kenosha um, featured you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, young guy, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse that, that, that was recruited into a militia uh, he wanted to be a policeman, wanted to defend property, ended up getting in way over his head and then interacting in a, in, you know, obviously in a, in a violent way with, with protesters, um, killing two guys. Uh, violent interaction was depicted by each tribe in their own way. Uh, the, the posing force in this, you know, it, to the tribes on the left was that Kyle was a, a terrorist. Uh, he was an example of kind of a Nazi or fascist uh, militia. And then the other side, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the right side portrayed him as a, a hero or a patriot that he had done nothing wrong. For, uh, in terms of the, the social networking, the social networking companies, uh, you know, punished or deleted anyone who said that, say, uh, Rittenhouse was, had done nothing wrong, took him off of Twitter. Zuckerberg apologized for not taking the militia advertisement off. Uh, their you know, inability to kind of maintain the status quo was, uh, was being a, a question. Um, I mean, their goal is not so much one side or the other wins, they just want a perpetuation of what it is right now, how they're making money. And so they'll just do the minimum necessary on either side until they're compelled to do something else. Um, and then that was followed up by a, a shooting from the from an Antifa killing a, a militia member for slinging paintballs. Um, again, you know these are all you know just back and forth tribal warfare. Uh, in tribal warfare, uh, people keep count of who dies and when they die and how many die. Uh, it's a back and forth in terms of punctuating the the you know the online conflict, uh, driving it forward, reducing the coherence of the of the opposition and in terms of coherence it means um the ability of the uh, opposing force to actually make cogent decisions um by attacking their ability to form facts collectively you know questioning you know, whether the fact is a fact or uh, spinning it in a way that 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 makes it questionable um makes them distrust the media makes them distrust the uh, what leadership in different organizations is saying. Um, and then that the process of actually resolving uh, the issue in, in public is, is, is flawed, uh, it's tainted. Uh, both sides in this case were saying that the, the legal process would be subverted, uh, that the media would handle it incorrectly, that the government would, would, would twist it and turn it. In many respects that's occurred. Um, and that the uh, the goals are in question, and that the uh, that the uh, society uh, that if you're attacking a group, you want them to have divided goals and and head off in their own direction and, and start to fork their their movement. Um, we're going to see a continuation of, of the use of violence within this kind of context to move the online conflict forward uh, to uh, have affect the uh, coherence of the uh, opposition's decision-making process to get it to fragment, to break into non-cooperative centers of gravity, to fight amongst itself. Uh, and that's the world we live in right now. So um, maybe if I jump to something, let's go to something entirely differently. Uh, you wanna maybe 
take questions on this or, or interact over this, or do you want to go right to the blue sky stuff? Um, maybe it'd be good to go to blue sky so we can get a queue of questions and statements lined up. Uh, if you have any questions, start throwing in the chat box, uh, or if you want to make a statement to the group as well, you can just put that in the chat box and I'll call on you. This will eventually go on YouTube. So um, if you don't want to be on YouTube, just indicate that. Okay, so is there any blue sky for this? <laughs> uh, this this uh, network tribalization, the road we're on. Um, I think there is, and, and a lot of people probably uh, listening to this or reading me would like like to see more things, things that decentralized, moved offline more, uh, moved more towards a kind of a resilient community type approach. Uh, would like to tone things down in that way, you know, right size our, our interactions, um, make them more personal, more, more tangible than they are right now. Um, and I think that's great. And I think that's gonna happen regardless, um, is that it still leaves open you know, what, what this fight is really all about and, it, and to a large extent and, and probably the, and the, primarily it's focused on who gets to control the, the network system that the, our civilization, our society in technology, you know, as a technological artifact. Um, combination of AIs and AIs I see not as human equivalents but as the uh, uh, intelligence that sits in between human interaction that's kind of in that space, thing that will modify and, 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 and uh, change and uh, direct uh, our interactions in, it, in, in the, any, any which way that we point it. Um, I don't see that not happening. It's, it's already happening to a, uh, in, a, in a commercial way at the big social networks. Um, so we're fighting over that. So how do we make that work? You know, in, in our favor? How do we make that uh, uh, develop in a way that's beneficial to all of us? And uh, one of the mechanisms I was coming up, or I came up with is um, more, you know, from an entrepreneurial outsider's perspective, is that we need to start to build kind of a digital persona that's protected and owned by us, that represents us. Um, right now, it's a mishmash. It's protected by privacy, which privacy is all over the map. Uh, it's a philosophical discussion, not a real level of protection. What we need is to actually own the digital representation of us and that the fact that once it's actually owned and uh, represents us and it reflects how well we're doing in the world and how well it does uh, impacts us uh, beneficially or, or negatively, uh, it then makes it possible for us to actually build AIs that make all of those digital representations advance based on goals that we have, based on needs that we have as individuals, but it's whatever those individual goals and needs and desires are reflected in that digital persona and then the AIs that we build move that forward. Uh, so we get a, you know, all, all boats rising uh, kind of uh, scenario. Now, it's not something that, it's not that kind of situation where we have, you know, all of these digital personas in, increasing in value, increasing in, in nuance, increasing in depth, uh, making the lives of the people that they represent better and better and better over time. It's not something you can design from the top down. I mean, you can set in motion a process where that can possibly happen, but all of the little, uh, things that, necessary, that need to go into making that happen is something that you need uh, open source projects, you need marketplace uh, interaction, you need entrepreneurs, you need uh, investment, uh, you need you know, public sector uh, involvement. It's something that we can get uh, improvement on from a lot of different directions. Um, without that, I mean, there's, horrible you know, solutions downstream. Um, for instance, this morning, I was looking at the way work was evolving and they had uh, somebody doing telepresence, uh, control of a robot in a 7-Eleven, in a you know, stocking shelves. Well, you know, the, what that represents is this world where we spend all of our time training robots and robotic AIs or AIs in, in abstract to do work, do the work that we're currently doing. And once it gets it down, then we move our work moves to managing the exceptions, 
because the AI is doing our primary work. And then once those exceptions are down, then we're out, we're gone. Um, and if that's done in the way that we are currently doing it, like the way we do with Uber drivers and the way we're doing with a lot of other uh, types of work, um, once that automation fully arrives, that those people are completely useless. Um, that category work goes away uh, very, very quickly, faster than we can actually accommodate moving them on to other things. So, um, so the digital persona approach is, is possible. Uh, another approach is to find uh, ways to uh, use this, uh, this, these online uh, AIs to just containerize our discussions, our public discussions, to regularize them. Uh, without constraining them so much so that based on you know uh, which tribe you're you're part of uh, that the uh, there isn't a descent function in the way we uh, operate as a society um, how that's done how that we actually reach that kind of conclusion in this kind of environment is is, is uh, hard to see uh, government isn't able to actually get their arms around these global multinationals they treat them um, with a lot of deference. And the percentage, for instance, of, of the business that Facebook does in, in the US is, you know, as part of their you know, global operation is declining on a daily basis. They may, may not be adding more customers in the United States, but they are adding uh, 500,000 new users a day around the world. So um, the ability of any given nation to actually leverage change on the platforms is, is decreasing with every day. Um, so there's just a couple ideas to kind of get people thinking if, if it makes sense at all. If you guys, uh, one thing I suggest you maybe you, you look at is look at the uh, selfish ledger. There's a, a great little video that uh, Google put out, um, or was put out for Google. Uh, it's on YouTube, it's worth watching. It takes the selfish gene concept and turns it into a uh, a selfish digital representation and I take it and, and change it into a kind of a digital persona that then can be acted upon by AI to, to uh, uh, make things improve for us. Is that good? It should, should get some discussion going. Um, yep. I know I'm only on a second cup of coffee so my brain is still <laughs> operating like at half speed but maybe if I get a couple more I'll, I'll be zooming by the end of the discussion. Cool, cool. Well, that was good. Um, so we have a bunch of questions already. Uh, I will read uh, Philip Chen's because it's uh, something that I'm interested in. He asked me to read on his behalf. Um, what is your view of game B? You know, Jordan Hall, Jim Rutt's term game B, uh, or the adjacent meta modernism that aim to be like meta of all these ideologies. Uh, how do you think they're likely to be pulled down into the culture war and this cancel culture uh, phenomenon? Yeah, metamodernism. Um, I've tried to wrap my head around it. I just operate too much in the operational. Kind of, it has to be more tangible for me. Um, and I, I, it's, I can see the need for a transition, but um, I don't think we, we have the luxury of waiting till everyone becomes metamodern or, or has the ability to handle all the complexity of the current environment. So we have to deal with what we have now and um, how people operate now and how people uh, will make decisions now. Uh, so um, that's what I'm trying to address in what, what I'm doing. Um, rather than getting too far into the theory crafting, you know, I found in, in, in doing, you know, uh, strategic theory or warfare theory, uh, it was very easy to you know, get ahead of the development of warfare, the way it was operating in real life. And then you get into this theory space and you could you know, wrap yourself around the axle. It's just like, it's just, you're, you're really just debating, you know, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, you know, it's like useless. Try to tie everything back to something that's more immediate. I actually have to see an example that really, or two or three or four to actually feel, get an intuitive feel for how things are developing, get an orientation for, uh, for it. Uh, you know, you know, like the OODA loop, you know, observe orient, orient being the most important step. 
that's very intuitive often. And you get a, once you get that intuitive feel based on example and tangible evidence, um, it's easier to kind of build the theories that match that. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's good. Uh, and I, I concur that uh, you quickly get untethered from reality when you're in meta land. Um, so let's start with uh, Hal. You had a question on journalism. I know. Uh, no, I can. I can speak this aloud. Go ahead. Um, so this is just me as a question. Is because I'm a journalist. I'm moving into. Uh, I'm actually moving. I just graduated. I'm moving into the one question. So there's multiple questions I have. One is nobody seems to have the same set of truths. People believe that like, oh, if you believe Fox News is now a different reality from New York Times. But then there's literally the question of, okay, even the coronavirus is like. Is this a seriously big deal? Is this not a big deal? So one, the one problem is that we're just in this environment where postmodernism and as well as like tribalism has basically removed any sort of baseline truth. And maybe that was always a fallacy to begin with. Peter Palmer Oxev in his book talks about the idea that there used to be this big truth represented by the BBC if you were a Soviet dissident, but then the BBC was one partisan in that two-fold war. And then the issue of objectivity versus commitment kind of comes in almost professionally because I want to get a job at a neutral endorsed organization, maybe if those are the ones offering jobs, but at the same time, I would, I have, I'm committed. I think the writer does have a responsibility. I mean, that was Sartre's whole idea. The writer is a responsibility as well as just the whole idea that people want to write opinions. Is the idea of objectivity even a thing? At the same time, if objectivity is not a thing, how do we come to a basic set of facts? Is that possible? more difficult or more impossible if you're coming from a partisan view. And finally, the promotion defense of free speech versus big tech and the question and cancel culture. And the question here is that um, I personally support, uh, I'm personally a First Amendment absolutist, but at the same time, you also get an issue of, uh, okay, why do people do this? Is free speech defense just going to be partisan? So you're always going to say, Let's, let's not beat around the bush. You're always going to say that you defend this because you're in that similar position. You're not going to defend it saying that I just know most people aren't going to be like, I support free speech in general. Okay. So that's why we're seeing like with like Twitter or whatever, removing things, which I don't think any of these social movie, media accounts are removing anything except like child pornography. But, uh, but really like you see a lot of this removals from various groups and there's no consensus seemingly on what should be done about that? Because even right-wing people who say that they don't like um, cancel culture are fans often of like taking down Antifa stuff, or they point out hypocrisy versus pointing out the idea that censorship is bad in general. Right. Okay. So um, you focused in on facts and truth initially, and um, you know we've seen a, a decline in, in agreement on what are facts, um, and that typically is, or at least, I, at least the way I've, I've seen it and the way I've written about it is that it's been accelerated by decline in cohesion. Um, when we don't see ourselves as part of the same tribe, uh, what happens is, is that you don't see facts presented or observed by other people uh, who aren't in your tribe as truthful, as reliable. And it all goes downhill from there. So, you know, all, it, all of the attacks, uh, say, on, on the Cold War nationalism of the United States, serve it or no, is, is, is done uh, wonders in terms of you know, reducing the uh, cohesion of the country, and, and, and it's accelerated, it's splintering into different tribes. Um, there's ways around it. Uh, one tribe could win. Um, another is that, you know, uh, what the tribes have done, these online tribes have done, um, in order to get around the you know accelerated fragmentation of what is truth and what people are for, because uh, kind of subjective formalization uh, of uh, what they value, and what values are best, um, is that they focused on what they're against, uh, kind of this pattern of behavior that they hate, that they all can come together to uh, oppose. Um, that seems to be relatively cohesive and uh, and enduring uh, as opposed to you know what what people are for uh, what people are in favor of the values that they hold highest 
Uh, they maybe have some loose terms for that, but there really isn't any uh, uh, cogent framework uh, for uh, what we see out there. Um, so we have the decline of nationalism, decline of what, you know, this kind of universal tribalism that we had uh, in the U.S. during the Cold War and in the immediate years afterwards, um, which then increases the contention, increases the uh, rise of, uh, increases the tendency to not trust facts from each other. Um, and online world kind of accelerating this individual formulation of uh, values and value systems uh, that uh, aren't reconcilable with uh, uh, each other. All right. so. Maybe I made it worse. Maybe I gave you a couple frameworks maybe to work with that may be helpful. I think you just described the situation. Oh, how do you how do you fix that? That's the question, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, one tribe wins, or we uh, uh, live with the complexity, but within bounds. So um, we lit. We work with the. Uh, social AIs, we bound it. We bought, so those AIs will bind our, our conversations within uh, this kind of an acceptable you know, uh, area. And um, then we hash it out in there. And uh, uh, it will be messy. And we just learn to kind of develop this thick skin necessary to actually operate in that um, environment. Very much so that, you know, it's very similar to, uh, when we uh, saw advertising on television, advertising had a, a you know a extreme influence on people in the early days because they just didn't have the uh, filters necessary to actually deal with it effectively. Um, so they put up an advertisement, go buy this, and people would go and buy it. Um, and over time, we developed filters, and we became uh, insensitive or desensitized to that kind of uh, influence. And um, we got used to it, and it didn't bug us as much. And we learned to, you know, go forward with our lives even with this kind of this influence being uh, uh, put on us on a on a daily basis. So we're going to do the same thing potentially with with this, you know, complex online environment. The help at all. <laughs> So you think we but have we learned to deal with ads? I mean, ads have just gotten more and more sophisticated with like micro targeting and all that stuff. I mean, that just feeds into all this also that the ads are not really universal either. They're all directed. Uh, they're all directed at us personally, often based on our tribes. I mean, think about like Nike or something like that. I mean, that's even that's not even on a very individualistic level, but that's still playing into the culture wars. Yeah, because they work so badly on the general scale, they're trying to go on to the individual level, um, but they're only you only get that kind of micro targeting in it through AI development. And it's really a question of whether or not we let AI be used in that way. All right. Uh, next question. Paul, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah. Um, so sort of similar to the one that I asked last week, but I guess in general, politics is obviously tra trailing technology by light years. Um, but one thing I think politicians have understood for decades is tribalism. Um, to what extent do you see them being unwitting participants in this new version of it? And to what extent do they capitalize on it? Yeah, um, I think they've been pretty quick to kind of join in. I mean, the Democrats have been pretty silent as the, the, uh, the protests have intensified, become more violent. Um, they're riding that wave and uh, they saw it as a, you know, an ad to their uh, campaign. Um, and that, you know, Trump is now fully engaged. I mean, just like, uh, I think it was last night, you know, he treated some, tweeted support for the, uh, uh, the guy that was killed in, in Portland. Um, and, um, this, you know, violent tribalism is being incorporated right into the campaigns as we speak. Um, but they're puppets of this. Um, they're not the primary drivers, okay? And uh, 
you know, you, they can participate with it and they can catalyze it and they can, um, as Trump did during the 2016 campaign, is that, you know, he, he was good at catalyzing it and good at uh, leveraging it, um, but they're not the primary drivers of these, these online movements. Um, and they can go in directions and take, push them in directions that uh, uh, they don't want to go in. But uh, there will be plenty of opportunists. This is the first round. And uh, as people get smarter, they're getting more power hungry. They're going to glow on to these tribes and, and play them for all they're worth. That, that sort of plays into an idea. I, I'll post more on the Discord at some point. But um, I've thought of these tribes as cults without cult leaders. And, and sort of similar dynamics. Yeah, yeah. open source, uh, leadership of an open source movement or open source uh, uh, insurgency um, is, is very contingent, okay? So in a protest or, or a political situation, yeah, it's if you're moving the insurgency or if you're moving the movement toward its goals, you're accepted as a leader. The moment you stray, the moment you try to take it off based, based on your principles or what you think is right or, uh, you know, in a direction that you think is going to be beneficial to the movement, that the movement doesn't uh, see as beneficial, then you're going to be cast aside. It takes 10 seconds to just go away. You know, we saw that, say, for instance, in, uh, uh, in Egypt, where there were leaders of the, of the movement during the push to get rid of Mubarak, and they would come up, and they, as long as they were moving the movement forward, they were accepted, they were cheered on. Um, but the moment they said, hey, let's talk about constitution, Let's talk about these more complex things. Let's get all the intellectuals together so we can, you know, hash this out. They were just, they left the stage. They were pushed off the stage. Um, it didn't last it long at all. Um, in the same case uh, we're seeing with the tribes. Uh, you can also move it forward by example. So uh, in, a, in a classic open source insurgency, like a, a hot shooting war like uh, Iraq, uh, if you want to move the, the insurgency forward, you blow things up. You go make an, a, a new attack, you tinker and come up with an innovative way of, 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 of harming the enemy. And then everyone copies it. And you are effectively leading the insurgency forward. So, um, and we're seeing that here, you know, the innovations that are being done on the street, uh, put in play, uh, the actions being taken are then being replicated and, and rolling out. All right. Uh... Kyle, you had a question. So John touched on this a bit. Um, I guess I'm thinking about how illiberalism comes into this and, and how that plays off authoritarianism. And so you were talking about how, how AI and central control of this was probably going to be in, involved in these uh, various social networks and or AIs that, are, that exist. But I'm also thinking about a model that evolves where each tribe has its own AI capacity and right. its own data sourcing and, and those sorts of things as it gets more and more edified inside of its own walls. Right. And so how do, how do you think about that interaction between centralized control, kind of the Chinese path, versus what we might see in the American path of this fragmentation is the illiberalism of those rules will be set by the tribes, right? Inside the framework of central governance. Right. right? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you have an overall overarching container, or, you know, overall container that has smaller AIs within it, the tribal AIs that could work. Um, in the sense of, in the case of China, it's just, it's just one, it's one gamified version. That, that's applied to everybody and, and it's very structured and very uh, uh, dictatorial in how it, how it approaches it. Um, but I think, uh, I think we're, if we follow the model that, that allowed the uh, US and the Western system to win in the Cold War, is that uh, we allow the, the greatest amount of uh, dissent to occur without tipping ourselves into chaos. Um, and, and, in the commercial sense that's done through a free market and then in, uh, not a directed market um, and free speech adds to that. And in this case, uh, it would be an AI that just has a very wide border uh, that uh, stops uh, violence from occurring or stops a, a extreme change 
from happening you know uh, overnight it keeps us within complexity rather than tipping over into chaos um, what that looks like i'm not quite sure and mm -hmm. i think though that if we're going to do this we uh, if we're going to survive this we're going to have to figure out what that is um, it's going to be messy it's not going to be uh, something that everybody agrees with but i think it it's something that probably need to have happen um, well everybody I mean, believes in liberalism for their yeah. own tribe right and right. and the problem is that if if your words offend me from another tribe I think you should be shut down, right? And depending on the level of my identity and whether or not I have multiple intersectional connections and, and how that all fits into various mimetic tribes. Right. And so how, 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 who's the, who's the, 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 what's the center of gravity for liberalism inside of all of this? And that's where I keep on losing, losing, it, squeezing sand, right? It's all right. going through my fingers. It, it, it feels like that ought to be, the thing we're all holding on to, um, but that's not what we're holding on to, the more identity we have. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. traditionally identity has been the kind of the short bus of history, right? So it's like the, the it's the thing that rips things apart and, and, and yep. causes everyone to spill tons of blood. Um, so, you know, if we head in that direction and we lock it in, that's going to be uh, a pretty debilitating future. Um, I mean, the, I mean, when I say AI, I mean, I, it, AI is really good at actually predicting behavior and, and, and you know, uh, what they found even with on Facebook is that the AI is actually better at predicting uh, potential suicides than doctors. I mean, they can actually see people in the process of, you know, make a real attempt towards suicide. So, I mean, if that's the kind of thing that can be trained into this uh, to kind of anticipate violence, anticipate extreme behavior. Um, and then nip it off at the, at the individual level, uh, circumvent it. And then, uh, you know, that's not going to be something that's easy to do, but I think if we're going to, you know, survive in a connected environment, survive in a networked environment, that we're going to have to learn how to do it. And McLuhan said the same thing. If we're going to survive this, if becoming global villagers, we're at, it, we're at each other's throats constantly uh, because everybody is like right up next to our, basis with, with their ideas and their thinking uh, is that we're going to have to turn society into a technological artifact to some degree. And what that looks like is this fight, right? Is it going to be a gamified lockdown version like China or is it going to be a uh, uh, Luddite, uh, let's turn, let's like filter everything out, put our heads in the sand like Europe, or is it going to be something that, that allows us to interact and, and with tension but not go outside the bounds that we fall apart and we kill each other with abandon. Seems pretty, it's pretty, pretty straightforward, but pretty complex and difficult to, to get your head around as, at the same time. Dennis, you had a few questions on OODA loops. Yeah, I'd, I'm actually in my class today going to talk a little bit about OODA loops in a different context. But as I was thinking about them this weekend, it sort of seems like all of us, I mean, all the inputs are cycling so fast. You know, it's like, it's almost a joke that, you know, like this thing that happened three days ago feels like it's three months ago. Right. It sort of feels like we're all being overwhelmed within those loops and and that the the easy way is to kind of kind of go with the tribe view and stay within that zone just because it makes it simpler for you to do so that's an observation my question is that i i i, I really love the mental model of the ooda loop but I, I just wonder if john might have some thoughts on um how you can kind of use the OODA loops in a better way to kind of uh, uh, figure out uh, what you need to know and how to uh, uh, to interpret what's happening in the world and then to act on that. Yeah, uh, part of our rewiring is that we were moving from uh, traditional forms of information processing towards a pattern matching approach and a collaborative pattern matching approach. And that's affecting the OODA loop. Um, it speeds it up. Um, and then it directs it, it, it dictates the pattern that you're curating with other people. Say it's, uh, 
you know, the government is, is fascist and everyone in government is, is trying to institute a fascist vision would be, would be shared and that's the orientation that you're operating from. Um, and that would dictate, you know, what you decide to do and, and how you act collectively. So can we do something to maybe break that, slow it down? Um, mostly, I think we could probably do it in, in, in online today by trying to slow down these, uh, what I call empathic triggers, these, these videos, uh, these little bits of information that, that then are immediately put into these patterns. Um, just find those very early on and, and slow them down, allow them to be processed effectively. Because right now uh, they're being used to generate more tribalism and their empathic connection to the victims is then uh, creating a, a tribal connection. Um, and that then becomes selective tribal or selective empathy. Uh, you have complete empathy with the, the, the group being attacked and you have zero empathy, uh, you know, negative empathy for the, for the attackers. You, I mean, you take pleasure in them uh, being damaged. So, you know, what we can do online and what can be done through picking up on videos and picking up on pictures and picking up on language choice that uh, is purposely meant to inflame and to drive this, this pattern matching effort is to stop it at that before it's even uploaded. Now, that's censorship, yes. Um, and what we would actually filter, that has to be something that we should decide collectively. Um, is it something we want to do? I think it may be something that we need to do in order to stop this from going off the rails uh, and getting to a point where we can't uh, ever even approach a decision like this. I'm curious what your thoughts are on deep fakes. Just kind of like an outside question. Um, and the implications on, on what? Of deep, deep fakes. Oh, deep fakes. Um, yeah, I don't think they're that important. I mean, you know, it's like, I mean, we could, we could take the same fact now and, and spin it two different ways or three different ways or five different ways. I mean, we don't need a fake in order to do that. I mean, fakes can, can be added to that. Um, you can have a video of somebody saying X, Y, Z, and, and that's like extra, but it's, I think, I think in order to have the maximum input or maximum effect, it has to start with some kernel of truth that it happened and then it's spun and then it's pattern matched and then it's fitted. Um, we do see fakes without the actual technical, technical wizardry uh, all the time when people claim that they were attacked or, or this happened uh, or they stage an incident. That's happened quite a bit. Um, Oh, I mean, it's like the, uh, uh, the Israeli teenager that was uh, from, from Israel through a satellite link, did the 100 plus uh, bomb threats to the JCC back a couple of years ago, Jewish community centers, and it caused a huge ruckus. But it was like, that's a staged event. That's event, essentially a deep fake without the technical element. Um, and that is, you know, could be automated as easily as, a, as, as you would in terms of generating a fake video. Um, so, I mean, it's just, I, I don't see any special prominence for deep fakes. You know, we're already getting it, we're already seeing it. I mean, if somebody, somebody generated a, a, a thousand bomb threats uh, in the early evening uh, that hit every single uh, polling place, in, in, in certain neighborhoods that would actually ha you know, have a meaningful impact on the, on the vote, um, that's a deep fake to, you know, but it's not the, what most people term a deep fake. And I think that kind of fake is even more, more disruptive. Albert Kim, you had a question. Hey, uh, hey John, so, um, you know, as a lot of people know, uh, the new language model, the GPT-3, the largest one uh, ever, just came out, and it's been changing the game. And I was wondering, how does the advent of a language AI like GPT-3 change the mimetic warfare landscape, given that it could scrape the entire internet and replicate existing memes and even generate new ones? 
uh, the way that I, I, something I could see happening from this is that we could have a fully automated memoir completely removed from human input that feeds back on itself. So I was wondering what you thought about something like language and AIs. Yeah. Um, I see that kind of top down efforts trying to, you know, you, you, you direct the AI to do this um, tend to be less effective than the, uh, the bottoms up efforts. Um, and we're already generating mimetic wars and, and, and uh, um, online wars through participation of millions of people uh, generating content, generating uh, amplification. Um, how a, an AI would, um, you know, fit into that, I'm, you know, in, in this one in particular, I don't see it adding a lot of value. Um, I do see a potential maybe at the micro level, okay? So, uh, you know, you could build, if, if this was set out as a bot, uh, a, a set of conversations that would go about recruiting a small group and then getting them to buy in to a, a mission or a set of missions that would then, you know, be terrorist in nature. So basically a virtualize a terrorist organization. Or you could do is say, you know, portray yourself as a, as a, you know, a person caught, a young woman that's caught or put in prison by, by this, this guy in, in the basement, it's got the hold of a phone and, and it targets and filters through uh, conversations online and finds vulnerable young men, uh, play out a script, a scripted dialogue. Uh, if you're playing a character with a limited uh, uh, view of the world and, and, and a, you know, with dialogue constraints, you can be very believable. Get this guy to say, the only way you're gonna free me, this violent guy, is to come to the house and shoot him, right? It ends up being a Supreme Court judge or something, you know what I mean? It's that kind of like, in really devious application of this kind of uh, uh, conversational ability or, or constructability of, uh, of uh, content. I, uh, on the mass scale, it's just, uh, I don't see it playing a you know, primary role. I mean, it may amplify you know, different sub-elements, but I don't see it as the primary mover. Uh, we're doing a pretty good job of it, uh, as is we, you know, we have, uh, what's a little over 7 billion brains uh, that are better than any AI available to us right now. So, you know, we have plenty of horsepower out there. All right. Uh, SG, you had a question. If you're going to mute yourself. Hey, yeah, uh, my, um, my question is with regards to, like, where do the and you're, you're the trying to put you on mute. Uh, these communities align around some kind of economic incentive, whether it's stock, crypto, whatever. They all buy in together, and it sort of keeps the click. Um, does that become a, a very effective tool for increasing the cohesiveness of it? And you know, is all the like tribal warfare that we've seen really just related to? Economics? Was it related to economics? Oh, sure. I mean, a lot of what we're seeing right now is, is because the we have a globalized elite who, after the Cold War, didn't see it in their best interest to ensure that all boats rised or you know, went up together, um, and that almost all the gains in the post-Cold War environment, you know, went to a small subset. I mean, very rich and and the. Uh, internationally competitive uh, upper middle class. Um, and that uh, that means that we have a huge group of people who haven't seen any gains and, um, you know, add in immigration, add in, you know, online uh, services and, and, and the like, and it becomes a uh, competition for a limited pie. And that, you know, who gets the seat at the table? And, there's, and then you have a kind of, delegitimizing events of, of the uh, Iraq war with WMDs, um, and then you have the financial crisis and the fraud associated with that that delegitimizes things um, and shows that you know, the elites are not really uh, 
operating in the best interest of the public and we have problems. Um, but that's all water under bridges, you know, what ended up happening. And um, now we are where we are at. Um, is there a way to kind of regain a, a kind of a common purpose nationally? Is there some way of, of building uh, some kind of common commitment to what we have together as a nation? Um, we may have, uh, you know, one thing I suggested uh, back in the beginning of the uh, COVID crisis is that we would, we could build this, you know, benefits of citizenship, uh, you know, contribute to the, the common good of all um, by uh, tying behaviors to a, you, you know, emergency UBI. So, uh, you know, a thousand bucks a month and you get tested or you wear masks or you, you don't engage in certain types of behavior that would be uh, uh, negative to moving the uh, uh, crisis to conclusion um, and that there would be something that we all contributed to and we all benefited from. Uh, it wouldn't be restricted, uh, emergency UBI wouldn't be restricted by uh, income. It'd be money coming in uh, regardless of how much you make and it would be based on you contributing towards concluding this. But if you're out walking around and, and or, you know, you host a party or you're at a party where there's people not wearing masks and things like that. I mean, it seems trivial, but that's something that could cost you money uh, on the UBI in this kind of scenario. And there would be like this, okay, you know, I'm getting something tangible for my contribution. All right. Uh... Laszlo, you had a question. You're, you're on mute still. Am I coming in clear? Yep. Okay. Um, similar to the, the just topic you're talking about the buy-in, um, say we develop like a network or a country or a city in an offshore or a rig or a new dating site, a new dance app, whatever. So we have the net that people want to buy in. Um, would it be how possible to use digital persona as the potential to get into that network? Is that a way like the network gets kind of secondary? We want people to write their own digital personas. We use that as, you know, the, the, the test citizenship. Would that be a way to sort of make that idea? Yeah, uh, potentially. I mean, I mean, you know, just blue, blue sky thinking here is that a digital persona would reflect everything in your life, right? Um, I'm kind of the view if you're, uh, you know, we're at the moment where the, you know, kind of the humanity is opening up its eyes. It's got a memory. It's, it's thinking collectively. Um, and that anything that's done offline is actually lost. It's kind of, you know, before you're, before it's born, right? It's just, lost memory and lost contribution. And that everything you do online and that's captured online is contributing to that. Um, is that it would reflect your, you know, your income levels and how you're spending it, uh, you know, your quality of life, uh, your, all the little nuances that, that can be captured and put into a digital form would be part of that. And that that would be something that uh, could be uh, improved upon. You know, and, and, and that you, if you have this new service that, or new um, organization that would help you improve that faster, uh, then uh, that potentially is a way of getting out of the nation state bubble. Um, you know, if you can get these quantified, quantifiable improvements, if, get the, if that persona is, is moved for, forward by this organization, then, uh, you probably would give your loyalty to that organization in the future. Um, but I mean, this is like, you know, science fiction, blue sky kind of thing, but I can see entrepreneurially how, how I would implement pieces of it. But uh, right now in this environment, it seems pretty remote that we're, we're going to get to that point. That answer your question and good. That covers it. Thanks. I always had a kind of a fantasy of a, of a Singapore or, or a smaller uh, nation opening up a kind of a digital citizenship and not offering the standard political goods, but offering something new and getting, you know, 
you know, millions of side odds. Um, yeah, it, but no one seems to be willing to do that given the current constraints of the way the nation state system works. Maybe as the nation state continues to weaken, we may see something different. Okay, we're coming close to the hour. So the, the formal recorded uh, Q&A uh, portion is coming to an end. Uh, and this is the end of the four part series, uh, Network Tribalism. Uh, so I just wanted to head over to John for any kind of final concluding thoughts. Um, well, thanks for everybody uh, participating in this. Thanks, Peter, for having me on. This has been fun. <laughs> um, now, what I do is I just come up with frameworks that can help people think about complex problems that are evolving right now. Um, you know, tribalism, how it works, how online warfare works, um, you know, where we're going in the future and, uh, uh, you know, where we've been in the past and how that contributes to where we're, we're at right now. So um, the idea with the frameworks is, is they don't have to be 100% correct. Um, they can, all they really are, are there for is to get you thinking to get you unstuck um, because the environment right now is very chaotic and it can be overwhelming, right? And uh, uh, that tends to cause anxiety, makes you upset, makes you know, people anxious, um, they get frozen and uh, a good framework can help you um, deal with that. And I'm pretty relaxed about it. I think the long term that we're gonna do okay. Uh, it's just that uh, things look a little chaotic now, but um, We'll figure it out. We've been through worse. Very well, cool. thanks everybody. And I'll stick around to, if you're gonna do a little conversation afterwards if you want. Yep, uh, for those of you who uh, wanna stick around after you press record, we'll take a, like a minute bio break and then we'll have like a 30 minute discussion. Uh, they've been quite fun and intimate. Um, and I'll close up with some upcoming events and announcements. But first, John, thank you so much for being the sense maker in residence. The first one, official one at the STOA. Uh, we'd love to have you, you back, maybe even after elections, let's see uh, if we're all still here. Um, upcoming uh, sense makers and residents are Dave Snowden, uh, Peter Wang, Zach Stein, Daniel Schmockerberger, Daniel Gertz. Um, so you can check that out at the website. Real quick for a couple of events. Tonight we have um, Intentionality Amidst Chaos. Uh, this is, this is an individual who does these wardly maps. I think that's what they're called. And then figure out how to kind of navigate these chaotic times. You can RSVP there. And then Daniel Schmarkenberger is coming in. It's going to be an epic session. I think we have over 200 people RSVP to that on Dharma Inquiry. Um, if you want something a little spicy, a little dangerous, the, the most dangerous philosopher in the world, Alexander Dugan, is, is coming to the STOA on September 21st. Uh, that might get uh, me in trouble, but hopefully not too much. Uh, if you want um, to, to figure out his the fourth political theory and maybe stress test it to the man himself, um, you can RSP there. And if you'd like to support what the store is doing, um, and I'll put John's Patreon as well. Uh, he's an excellent uh, Patreon. You can go here. Um, yeah, so that being said, thanks everyone. Uh, you can stick around. Uh, we'll go a one minute bio break before we restart the, the sense making session. I'll stop recording.